Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to Jeremiah, the 13th chapter. Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, verse 23. Jeremiah's in the Old Testament. 13th chapter and the 23rd verse, these words. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then I want you to turn with me to the New Testament, to the eighth chapter of Acts, the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, beginning at verse 26. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a nobleman of great authority, under the queen of Ethiopia, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the nobleman answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet? This, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the nobleman said, See, here is some water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And the nobleman saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. I'm often asked if the Bible has anything to say about the beginning of the races and the various colors of skin. If you look at our audience here tonight, I think you'll see every color of skin that there can possibly be. Agba Haq, sitting on the platform from India, was just reminding me, he said, this is a tremendous international audience. And it is, I suppose, if I should ask for all the races of the world to stand up, there would be hundreds here tonight from every race that there possibly is, not every nationality, but every race, as the anthropologist would divide us by races. Now, where did these races begin? How did we get the color of skin that we had? Now, when you go out here on the beaches at Waikiki, you can see that very few people are satisfied with their skin color, especially the white people. They all want to be darker. Now, where did all that begin? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us where the colors of skin came from. There's no use going to the Bible trying to speculate and trying to figure it out. It just doesn't tell us. The Bible says we're made of one blood. All the races under heaven. And we all are creatures of God. God is the heavenly father of all the race in the sense of creation. So the Bible doesn't tell us. Now, the Bible does tell us where languages came from. I don't know whether it tells us where Hawaiian came from or not, but it does tell us where languages came from. 
You have such a beautiful language, and especially when you express it in music. I love the, the music that you have out here. This spirit of aloha seems to be in your music. It seems to be in your expression, in your smiles. I've never been to a state or a place where everyone seems to have a certain amount of happiness. He may be unhappy inside, but he seems to cover it up with smiles. And it's a wonderful thing for us to come where people are so busy and running back and forth, dodging traffic, as we are in the eastern part of the United States, come here where you're a little bit more relaxed. It's a great experience for us to come here. And we know where the languages came from. When they built the Tower of Babel, the first United Nations ever built, and they were going to take the place of God, God judged them. Because you see, the Tower of Babel left God out. And so it couldn't possibly be a success when you leave God out. And judgment came and God scattered them and gave them different languages so they couldn't understand each other. And we still today, thousands of years later, speaking different languages. And old languages are reviving. Why, they're having a war down in India over in Agbahak's country, over the fact that they've ruled that Hindi is to be the official language instead of English, so they're having a war about it. Riots, killings over language. Now this passage of Scripture says, can the Ethiopian, can the African, change the color of his skin? Now, some people are trying to change the color of their skin. But the Bible indicates that the skin color is not the important thing. That's not the important thing at all. Now, we are having a racial problem in the United States. We were told by some enthusiastic, zealous people that if we passed the civil rights law, that that would solve all of our racial problems. But what's happening in many parts of the United States indicates we need something more. It must come deeper than the color of the skin. It must come deeper than legislation. It must come from the heart. Oh yes, we need legislation. We need laws to regulate us in many areas of our lives, but unless it comes from the heart, we are never going to basically solve any of our problems. And that's why it's so important that we have a great spiritual awakening in America so that men will come to love their neighbor as themselves. And I suspect that a great part of the problem in America in race is not so much the color of skin as it is psychological. There's a psychological barrier that I suspect could be overcome by a great spiritual awakening that would plant in our hearts love for each other, recognizing that we are of one blood under heaven. But God says that the problem is not the color of the skin. Here's what the scripture says, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In other words, your heart is the thing God looks at. He doesn't look at the color of your skin. He doesn't look at your bank account. He doesn't look at your social standing. He looks upon your heart. And the question I want to ask tonight is this, is your heart right? Now, the heart in the Bible has come to stand for the center of the moral, spiritual, and intellectual life of a man. And the Bible teaches that in the sight of God, our hearts are sinful. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 18, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Jesus said, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus again said, far from within, out of the heart of man proceed all these evil things in the world. 
And the Bible teaches that God knows the heart. Shall not God search this out for he searches the heart? I, the Lord, search the heart, said Jeremiah. And the question is not race or skin color. The question tonight is, can a man's heart be permanently changed? Can you change your heart? That's the big question. And that's the thing Jeremiah was asking. Can the leopard change his spot? Can the Ethiopian change his skin? And the answer obviously is no. But we can change the heart. God can change it. Now I want you to look at this African. He was an African nobleman, a man obviously of great education high standing. He was the treasurer of a great empire, serving his queen. And here we get a picture of his world. It was a world in which there was a great deal of persecution and strife. It was a world in which the blood of Christian martyrs were flowing everywhere. You know, when I used to think of martyrs, I used to have to project myself back 2,000 years and think of the martyrs under Rome. And I would visualize the great arenas where the martyr, martyrs would go out and be torn apart by the lions and the wild beasts or would go to a stake and be burned. But did you know that more people have died in the 20th century for Jesus Christ than any century in the history of the Christian church? Think of the few in the last few weeks we've read about Dr. Paul Carlson in the Congo. Jim Elliot among the Aka Indians in Latin America, those heroes of the cross in South Vietnam that have been captured in the villages and they would ask for the head man who was a Christian and they would cut his tongue and his eyes out and then bury him alive. Many stories of torture and death, blood is being spilled on the ground once again in our generation, in our century. For Jesus Christ, will it come to America? Will it come to Canada? Will it come to Western Europe? It may come. And it may come in our lifetime. We don't know what the future holds. Things are moving so fast now. Tremendous things are taking place in our world. And we must have a faith that is willing to suffer and the kind of a faith that wilts at a party when temptation comes. The kind of a faith that wilts at a high school or a college and won't stand up and suffer the little bit of social ostracism that might come if you're a Christian in your particular area, in your business, in your neighborhood, in your school. That kind of a faith won't stand as Paul Carlson had to stay, and as Jim Elliot had to stay, and many others that have died in the last few months for Jesus Christ. And that was the kind of a world that Philip the evangelist, persecution had come to Jerusalem, and now the disciples had been scattered, and he went up to Samaria, and he was preaching the gospel in Samaria. And he had a great revival. In fact, one of the greatest Awakenings in history took place up in Samaria and Philip was preaching to great crowds. He was an evangelist. And did you know that every Christian ought to be an evangelist? Paul wrote to Timothy and said, do the work of an evangelist. I'm called Evangelist Graham. I remember when they first started calling me that I resented it. I thought of emotionalism, big collections, anti-intellectualism. All of those things came to my mind when they talked about evangelists and an evangelist. And I didn't want to be called an evangelist until I began to realize here was a great biblical word. The word evangelist means herald. He's a herald of truth, God's truth. I don't make up the truth. It's God's truth that I'm heralding, that I'm speaking, I'm announcing good news that God loves you and is willing to forgive you and change you. And Philip, was an evangelist having tremendous success when suddenly in the middle of the great awakening and great crowds of people and hundreds coming to Christ, in the middle of all that, God said, leave. 
and go down to a desert place in Gaza. Well, there was nobody down there in that desert to leave this great evangelistic awakening, to leave this great revival and go down to a desert. But Philip didn't argue with God. He didn't debate. He obeyed God immediately. One of the greatest problems we have is when to close a crusade. Many of the ministers and many of the people here feel this crusade should go on. But there are no plans to extend the crusade. We feel that by Sunday, God will have done the work that he meant to do. It's very difficult sometimes to close when the crowds are coming and the stadiums are filled. And yet God seems to signal in our hearts time after time when we should go on, when we should stop. Philip stopped. The great crowds went back. He went down to a desert, and humanly speaking, it looked very foolish. And then, while he was down there meditating, he saw a chariot coming down the dusty highway, and behind the chariot were many other chariots. He knew that here was a great noble figure riding in a chariot. Slaves were driving the chariot, and sitting in the chariot was a nobleman with the royal insignia of Ethiopia on it. And he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip heard him reading out loud as he passed by. And he was reading from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, which was written 800 years before Christ, but is the greatest description of the death of Christ found in all the Bible. Isaiah the prophet, inspired by the Holy Spirit, sat down and predicted accurately how Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was to die. And this is what the Ethiopian was reading. And so Philip ran and said, Sir, wait just a minute, sir. The Ethiopian ordered the chariots to stop. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I understand it unless somebody helps me? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. When you come to the Bible, you can't make heads or tails out of it, can you? Just be honest now. You don't understand the Bible when you read it. And you'll never understand it except by the help of the Holy Spirit. You see, this is a divine book, a supernatural book. You may be a professor at the university. You may be a PhD in many fields. And this book is a closed book to you. You can't figure it out. It's a bundle of contradictions. It's unscientific to you because you don't understand the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit that has to interpret it. And only a man that is enlightened by the Spirit of God can understand this book. That's the reason only a true believer in Jesus Christ who has committed his life to him can really teach this book and really understand it. And so, the Ethiopian nobleman said, I don't understand what I'm reading. So Philip had been led by the Spirit of God to go talk to one man. And preaching to one person may be the greatest sermon that I'll ever preach. I have had the privilege of preaching to great crowds all over the world. We just had these people here from Australia, and we had great crowds in Australia. And all over the world, and I don't know why they come, except God sends them. And that's been a great privilege. But I believe that some of the greatest opportunities I've ever had have been with one person. You see, I think one of the greatest sermons Jesus ever preached, he preached to Nicodemus, just one man. One of the greatest sermons Paul ever preached, he preached to a governor, Felix. So you can talk to one person. And it may be more important than this great crowd here tonight that I'm talking to. Just witnessing to one person about Jesus Christ. That's what Philip was doing. God had brought him from a great evangelistic campaign with thousands of people down to talk to one man because God wanted the gospel to go south into Africa, south of the Sahara. And the, when the missionaries arrived years later, they found Christian groups here and there in various parts of Africa and all through Ethiopia brought originally by this great nobleman that had been led to Jesus Christ by Philip. 
God was opening up a whole continent through one man. And so Philip began to explain to him what it was all about. Here was what he was reading. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a dumb lamb before his shearers. So he opened not his mouth. Now the Ethiopian had probably not heard of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He didn't know what it was all about. Somebody had given him the Hebrew scriptures and he was trying to figure it out. And God the Holy Spirit had led him to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and it was in this place that the Bible says that Philip joined him and began to explain. And do you know what Philip preached to him? Philip didn't preach a sermon on social responsibility. Philip didn't preach about the tyranny of Rome. Philip didn't even preach about the race problem. He didn't even preach about slavery and there were slaves right there. Because Philip preached first things first. And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. That's first. Then you have the ability and the dynamic and the power and the possibility to love your neighbor. God first, your neighbor next, yourself third. That's God's order. He preached Jesus to him. And would to God in the pulpit today, we could hear just Jesus. Philip preached Jesus. Now, Jesus, after you receive Christ, is applied to every area of your life. It's applied to the race problem. He is applied to the poverty problem. He is applied to the slum problem to the housing problem. There are Christian principles that we apply in our society, but first we must meet Christ. We must know Him as our Lord and our Savior. And so he preached to him, Jesus. And then they came to a bit of water. And the Ethiopian nobleman said, Philip, what would hinder me right now from being baptized? I would like to be a Christian. I would like to serve Christ. I would like to follow Christ. What would hinder me? And you know what Philip said? If thou believest with all thine heart, I want to ask you tonight, do you believe with all your heart? Are you willing to believe with all your heart? What does the word believe mean? It means that you put your confidence and your faith in Jesus Christ. You're not trusting yourself. You're not trusting your good works. You're not trusting your money. You're not trusting anything except Christ. You believe with all your heart that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And no one is ever going to get to heaven unless they have believed with all their heart and confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus. You say, but Billy, I, I, I have a little bit of faith. That's enough. Jesus said it only takes the faith of a mustard seed, and you can hardly see a mustard seed. Have you ever seen one? I've seen a mustard seed. And you almost have to have a microscope to see it. Jesus was using the smallest thing he could think of that the people would understand, and he said, that's all the faith you have to have. Then he taught that your faith would grow. You start out with a little bit of faith. It may be a shaky, wobbly faith. But if it's in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to have faith enough to hold on to him. He'll hold you. Like the little boy that was on the great rock. He had fallen out of a boat and he finally climbed up on a rock and the storm was raging and the waves were lashing. And somebody asked him later, was he afraid? Oh, he said, I sure was afraid. He said, I trembled all over. But he said, the rock never trembled. You and I may tremble in our weak faith, but God won't tremble. He'll hold you. That's the kind of faith that we have. Faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Christ is the one that did the dying on the cross for you. He took your sins. And God raised him from the dead. 
And God was saying by his resurrection to the whole universe, I have accepted the atonement of my son. And the word atonement means at one moment. It really means a covering. Through the atonement of Christ, he covered your sins so that now God can't see your sins. If you're in Jesus Christ, God cannot see your sins because Christ took them. Oh, you're a sinner, all right. You've broken his laws and you've sinned against him and you deserve hell. You deserve judgment. I deserve, Billy Graham deserves judgment and I deserve hell, but I'm not going to hell. Not because I've worked my way up and not because I'm good or not because I've preached to great crowds of people. I am saved because Christ took my sins on that cross. That's what the passage said in Isaiah that Philip was explaining to the Ethiopian nobleman. He said this was talking about Jesus who died on the cross. And by the resurrection, God is saying to all of you, because he died, I've accepted his atonement. I've accepted his sacrifice in your place. The debt is paid. You don't ever have to pay for your sins. I'll never have to pay for any sin that I've ever committed. In all my life, it's all paid for. And I put my confidence in Jesus Christ. When I come to the gate of heaven, and if they have a password, I'm going to say only to the cross I cling. I have no other hope of heaven except by his cross. I believe it with all my heart tonight and I don't have a single doubt about it. You say, that's impossible. When I first started out, I had a lot of doubts because my faith was so weak. But I have no doubts. I can say with Paul tonight, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And what a wonderful thing it is to know that. You see, I'm prepared to die. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. And when you're prepared to die, you're also prepared to live. It'll help you to live because you don't get panicky with the pressures of life. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great peace. It's a great joy. It's a great security. It's a great assurance. Someone said to Gypsy Smith, the great evangelist, when he said that once, they said, Gypsy Smith, you must be dreaming. He said, if I'm dreaming, let me dream on. It's a wonderful dream. And when I see the people in the world going to pieces and their hollow laughter, trying so desperately to find pleasure, running in this direction and that direction, trying to find peace in this direction and that, and failing, and the same old emptiness and the boredom and the mystery of life. They don't know where they came from, why they're here, where they're going. So confused and getting more confused all the time. It's a wonderful thing to know, to be sure. And you can be sure and you can know. And this man said, what hinders me tonight or today? Philip said, nothing hinders you if you believe with all your heart. And then listen to what he said. Listen to what this noble man said. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Philip said, that's good enough for me. Get down in the water. And he was baptized right there. Now, it doesn't say whether he was immersed or sprinkled or poured on. I'll let your denomination tell you that. I've got my idea. And my wife has her idea, and it doesn't agree. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that he believed. That he believed. Do you believe? And that word belief means that you're willing to acknowledge that you've sinned because faith and repentance go hand in hand. And it means that you're willing to change your whole way of living. It means that you're willing to turn your back on your sins that are wrong 
And it means that you're willing to lead a new life and have a new dimension to your life, a new objective to your life. Now, here's what it means. You're going in this direction. You turn around and you start a new direction. It doesn't mean that you become perfect now. It means that you've started in a new direction in your life, a new commitment, a new highway, a new road. I'm asking you to take that step tonight. What hinders you? Your pride? Oh yes, pride keeps many people from coming. Your timidity? Jesus said, if you're not willing to confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. It's important to make it a public confession. Some of you have really secretly believed in your heart. You're a secret believer, but you've never made it open, never made it public. Every person that Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. Everyone. Did you notice that? Everyone. There's something about making it public. That's why I ask people to come follow, because I believe it's the scriptural way to make an open declaration of your faith and your commitment. There's something about it that God wants us to confess it and acknowledge it openly. I'm going to ask you tonight to believe in your heart, to acknowledge it openly as this Ethiopian nobleman. And notice what happened afterward. After he'd been baptized, the Bible says he went his way rejoicing. I've never known a man to receive Christ and never regret it. I have never had a person in all my travels around the world I've never had a person put his hand in mine and say, I'm sorry I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. He's let me down. Not one. But I've had many, many, many say with gray hair and bald heads, I rejected Christ when I was young. And I'm sorry. I regret it. I would to God I'd given my life to God years ago. I've had many young people in trouble. A girl that yielded to the temptation of a moment. Oh, I wish I'd received Christ and had his strength to rely on. A boy dying on a battlefield. I would to God I'd received Christ. I'm going to ask you tonight to receive it, to believe in your heart, to commit to surrender. Whoever you are, whatever your religious background or you may have no religion, you may be in the church, you may be a member of the church, but down in your heart you're not sure that you've really received Christ. Not sure in your heart that he's yours. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform quietly and reverently. And this is an outward sign of an inward decision that you're making tonight. You're committing your life to Jesus Christ. No, you cannot change the color of your skin, but you can have your heart changed by Jesus Christ. And you can find a whole new life that you never dreamed existed.